Hey, Tommy. Hey. Hey, buddy. I'm just, I'm Dave Lawrence. I'm just getting uh, your partner on the other line, making the oh, uh, the conference happen. Yvette, are okay, you? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you guys on hold and pull Cheech up. All right, you got you rock. Can you hear me? Okay, Tommy. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Fantastic. Appreciate it, brother. Good talking to you from the uh, Cape Boy days. You were been my guest a few times about ten years ago. It's I been bet. a long time. I bet. Yeah. Long time. But uh, yeah, this will be a fun still one. Happening, huh? Say again. You still happening? I am now doing public radio, trying to do something a little more productive with uh, with well, my. You mean trying to get a better paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and just loving on the world. You can do a little more when you're not just talking. You know, how many times can you hear "Give me three steps"? I mean, God bless Leonard Skinner, but it's just, you know, <laughs> no kidding. You know, life moves on, and and there's other things out there. But uh, but uh, great to hear yeah, your you, voice again. You discover you have a brain. Right. Okay, I think we have everybody on the line. Cheech. Hey Cheech. Hello. Hey, there you is, go. Is Cheech there. Cheech. Yeah, here I am. <laughs> can you hear Tommy? Cheech, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I hear you. Can you remember? Can you remember English? A <laughs> uh, little, little bit. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Cheech, for for joining us. It's it's Dave Lawrence, uh, HPR, and I'll try to so, so that we don't step all over each other. I'll do my best to direct a question at each of you, uh, just for for the for the sake of making it sound like something listenable when we're done. And uh, super super appreciate it. Uh, it's a big aloha and mahalo to Richard Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong. They're joining us here on member supported Hawaii Public Radio. All things considered, ahead of the big tour and. Uh, yeah. Hey guys, open up. I've got the stuff. Let me in. I feel like I should say being someone named Dave, but good to, ha- good to have you both on. And, and I guess my understanding is Dave's not here was the very first bit you ever did. It was a hot day a long time ago. Sort of a prank on Cheech, huh, Tommy? Can you tell us how that went? Well, you know, Cheech uh, is just a very serious actor, you know, and he's uh, he has a method. And so... We were we were practicing for a radio bit, you know, but he still insisted on on going outside and putting on the costume and you know to get in character. Right. And uh, and the door locked from inside, and so as much as he knocked, he couldn't open the door. I wouldn't let him in, so I just wanted to see how long I could keep him outside before he uh, had a nervous breakdown. And uh, it was for quite a bit, <laughs> but luckily we recorded the bit. And so, so all that uh, prankster came uh, to fruition. You know, uh, when when we listened to it back, uh, we found out that we had a, a, a bona fide funny bit that gone. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's famous all over the world. Cheech, can you still remember on your end uh, doing the bit prior to bringing it to Lou Adler, who wanted to record it professionally? And if you can, uh, I've never really heard either of you talk about when you ended up recording it uh, in a studio, if you can share a little illumination on that part. Well, we we played it a bunch of times in the little room where we recorded it. We just something cracked up. I mean, cracked up uh, uh, every time we heard it more and more, and we just... <laughs> So we got to pick this up to Lou, so we did, and he, he had the same reaction. So that night we went into the studio, a little mix down room at A and M, and recorded the the best version of that we could get. And you still think overall that original, which I understand has just been lost as the way things go in history, that was just no comparison to that. But literally, this is what <laughs> this is what kicked it all off, huh? Yeah, yeah well, really. the, the the original was. <laughs> Had some obscenities in there that uh, we couldn't have played on the radio, but <laughs> it was it was funnier, uh, believe me. So the one we did in the the studio, I, I listened to it just recently, uh, and uh, it still makes me laugh because I. I it just had the right rhythm, you know? Yeah, no doubt, and it still makes a lot of people laugh, uh, and and I can imagine. Were there any outtakes to that? Did you guys end up with a, a few different versions, and then you pick one, or was it the kind of thing, you nailed it, and, and that was it? We didn't like to work any more than we had to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, we always, you know, even with the movies, you know, uh, we always shot the rehearsal. Right. Because, uh, you know, you, 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 you get a... You get something very pure and, and, and natural, and then when you sometimes when you try it, it just you overdo it. And but uh, yeah, we we didn't like to work that hard, you know. 
Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of value to that. You, uh, sometimes before the recording session starts, you got to make sure the mics are on, are hot because that's when the best stuff uh, happens. No question. Absolutely. No question. And and Cheech, uh, it was a, uh, a a comedy group, City Works. I understand you sort of joined each other in that thing. Perhaps Tommy was already in it. If you can kind of share your earliest memory of how you guys got together and meeting each other. Tommy was running this improvisational theater group in a topless bar at Skid Row Chinatown in, uh, in Vancouver. And uh, uh, so we got introduced by a couple of friends, and I came down to see the show, and I got hired as a writer. And we, but it was, it, was, it was the most interesting combination of, of humor and, and topless. Uh, you know, what we figured out at the end is what we were doing is hippie burlesque. Wow. Tommy, you were doing this thing and... It was his club. Right, and that was where you were doing your R&B and doing your music and stuff. Well, you know, that's where I started. You know, it, uh, we had an after-hours club as well. We had two clubs. It was family-owned. And uh, I started in in the after-hours club, and then we got offered the, the strip club. You know, like uh, the owners of the building basically said, hey, you want a club, you got it. And so when we took it over, we, you know, we're breaking even, and we're doing pretty good with it. But when I got I got fired from Motown because I had to get a green card, and nobody at Motown knew what a green card was, <laughs> except Barry Gordy, who was paying for it. And so uh, I got fired, and, and, and then I decided to stay fired. I liked that feeling. And so I went back to Vancouver, and I started working in the strip club, you know, just doing the lights and, you know, just... Uh, enjoying uh, enjoying the freedom that I had not working. And then uh, when I was doing the lights, I was doing, the light man for the strip show, I, I had this idea of, of doing improvisational acting because the, the girls, when they would come to work, they looked so beautiful in their street clothes. But when they put on their, their you know, their costumes, uh, they, you know, they look like any other stripper, you know, it was like, uh, they're, you know, it wasn't exciting. And so I envisioned the girls taking off their street clothes on stage, being themselves, and that would be sexier, and, and I was right. <laughs> but uh, we had to fill in the rest of uh, the night, you know, in between them getting naked, with uh, comedy. And, uh, and that was so much fun, because the, the crowd was, were, was, a, was not expecting comedy. Right. And they were expecting uh, naked women. And so we had an audience that we could just have so much fun with because, you know, they believed everything you said. And so we used to torture them because when I started the, the, the theater company, I, I attracted a lot of theatrical people, you know, very intelligent, uh, talented people that, you know, like we had a, a classical guitarist and we had a, a mime artist came down. And so we would put the mime artist on with the classical guitars before the girls came out. And the audience, you know, they were expecting naked chicks, and all of a sudden they got a, a, a mime artist uh, picking flowers, <laughs> imaginary flowers, and prancing around the stage. And so we would torture the audience as long as we could, and then we'd hit them with some really funny comedy, and then we'd bring out the girls and, and do skits where they got naked. And so it was, it was such a, but what happened, it turned into a, a, a bona fide theater and we lost money. We were packing the house, but we weren't making near the money we were making with, uh, with the drunk, uh, bikers and, the and the perverts, you know? So my brother fired us and then Cheech and I stayed together and we came down to LA and the rest is history. Cheech, so you head up to Vancouver, I understand, because you're looking to get away from the Vietnam War, which is raging. They're sending lots of folks over there. It's a complete nightmare. You end up in Vancouver. Did you get Did you get your way over to the club just independently, like, hey, this looks like a fun place to hang out, or, or was it something else that brought you over there? You know, it's funny because the first day I got there, my friend took me down to Chinatown, and we walked past the, the Shanghai Junk, the club, and and there was this... Uh, this Photographs in the in the window, little display window that they had their case, and the naked girls with uh, with guys in costumes like policemen or army guys. Like, what the fuck? Is, I'm what the hell is this? And and so, uh, well, I got introduced to Tommy through this editor of this rock and roll magazine called Poppin that I was writing for at the time, 
And he said, you guys got to meet for some reason. And so we did. That's huge. Well, that's a great thing, and that's a story I've never heard before. And, and another aspect, and I'm, I'm sure it comes next somehow, how did the reefer get into such a central theme in the comedy originally? Um, was it was it one of you that brought the idea, or both? I guess, Tommy, w- what's your thought on that? Well, what happened, uh, you know, in the strip club, we, we did uh, maybe one or two, maybe one uh, reefer joke, uh, yeah, I think we did one, but it was a crowd that was there to see naked women, you know, so we did a mostly sex jokes. And then when we got, came to uh, L.A., we started working in front of, um, of uh, young, you know, a younger crowd, we, we found the one thing that unified everybody was the pot joke. Mm. And especially this one club that we played at, it was a dance club, and so the dancers had to stop dancing well, we did our show, and uh, and that that was tough because before that, you know, before we had to compete with the, anything, you know, we had a captive audience. They had no choice but to watch us. But here's a dance club that you know they could dance or they could walk away, they go outside, have a break. You know, they didn't have to watch us, mm-hmm. and so they weren't that thrilled stopping to dance. And so then we had to come up with. Uh, Something that you know would resonate with these uh, with this new audience would hold their attention, and, and it turned out to be uh, uh, Cheech's character, the Chicano character. That's that's when we started using the Chicano character, and that's when we started uh, you know having the character pick up an old hippie, uh, 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 you know, like a hitchhiker, hitchhiker and the red freak, you know, the guy that was a you know, downer freak. And and that really was the genesis of of Cheech and Chong as far as uh, being popular all over the world. It, it started right there, and, and that was the reason. It was the audience that made us change. And Cheech was the the connection to marijuana has been all these years later. Obviously, despite Nash Bridges, despite all the different things from dusk till dawn, wherever people have seen you, heard you, known you from, it's still this enduring phenomenon. When Tom, at the time that Tommy's describing uh, in L.A., you're doing this. W- were you already smoking marijuana, or was it something that you were? This just became a bit that you would use. No, no, we always it was all around us. That was the culture. Everybody smoked weed. Everybody that we knew hung out with so that was the world we were talking to you know it wasn't any hey let's do a hip smoke a reason bit you know no but that was just we were just reflecting the culture that we were immersed in and it was just yet so innovative, sort of like the, the comedy approach that, that Tommy was describing, which was, uh, as my operations manager said the other day, it was very underground. This is before the Internet. This was very it was spread grassroots. It was like one guy telling another, have you heard this, this, this new comedy team kind of, kind of thing? A, a guy's name who's associated with your earliest years, and I'm just curious how much of a role he had in helping you out all, all these years later, how you think that Lou Adler factored into being an important figure behind the scenes or not. Tommy, what do you think? Well, Lou Adler w- was the man. You know, when we got to L.A., we we went through a succession of managers. You know, we had uh, Three Dog Night, uh, you know, Brett Foster Associates. They they tried to manage us, but not really, you know. And and there was a few more, you know, they, we had these sort of like uh, comedy managers that they couldn't do anything with you. But when we met Lou Adler, he owned a record company. And so as a result, we could record, uh, you know, we could have a record to tour behind. And that's what we needed. And, and Lou, uh, of all, everybody there, you know, in fact, we, we were doing a, a, a showcase for Warner Brothers Records when Lou Adler was there in, in the audience. And he was really the only one that, because he grew up in East L.A. or Boyle Heights. And so he knew the, the Latino, the Chicano uh, culture, hands down, and then he was also involved with all, all the hip musicians at the time, you know, like Carol King and, and uh, uh, Mary, Clay, Mary Clayton, and so he was in, in both worlds, and then when he saw us, he, 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 just, he just knew that, uh, you know, he had stumbled across, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, hit, uh, hit uh, comedy team, and so... He brought us in his office, and he gave us anything we wanted, you know. And and, uh, and and what we would do, we would record 
we we try to record with uh, with Lou, uh, you know, in you know, uh, producing, but it, it never worked out that well because we write as we record, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of rewriting going on. And so what we would do, we would go to a little mixed on room and we would record our our version, and then we would send it to Lou, and Lou would. Uh, listen to it and then give us his notes and and then uh, that's how we uh, did what uh, about nine uh, nine albums or eight albums uh, and, and they were all hit and we got a Grammy with one of them so it was a good combination. Talking about the Grammy that you mentioned and also the development of, of Cheech's personality. Cheech, uh, it must have been a very powerful thing to win a Grammy. It's your third record. Uh, you guys were uh, a sort of an underground thing going, going into the mainstream. If you can, can you reflect on that time and also the development of that Latino Chicano character that became such an integral part of the mix? Yeah, I saw, you know the Grammy win was was great, but we were always on the road. We were nominated for the Grammy for every album we made, right from the very first end. And so we didn't pay much of attention to it. But first of all, because we didn't win, and the second because we were on the road all the time. Oh yeah, we got nominated. Oh great, we got to get on the plane to go to St. Louis, you know. And so it was, but the, the third one, you know, I, I think we were on the road even when we won. So that was that was nice. Nice to have that little trophy in the house, and then but the Chicano character just kept evolving, you know. And there was the Chicano and then the hippie in the car were the two strongest characters, you know. And they they eventually became what people uh, recognize as Cheech and Chong, because you know, we did a lot of other bits, a lot of other characters, but uh, those two guys always got the, a big cut in the album. You know, so they were known. So when we went to make movies, it was logical that those two guys would be the star of the movie. And that's a great transition to my very next question, which, uh, Tommy, how does, I mean, this is such an organic thing. It goes from stand up at, in a really unique way at a club to provide sort of augmentation for much different entertainment. Then there are albums to help sell it as it becomes a stand up bit on the road as an independent attraction of its own. And as Cheech just mentioned, finally it becomes movies. How does it go from the albums to the movies? It was a natural transition, you know, because uh, we started out as a visual act. You know, we weren't a radio act. We weren't, uh, you know, a record act. We were a, a visual uh, live act. And, and so, but we, we adjusted to the radio uh, real, real easy, you know. And, and then adjusting to movies, it was real simple. The genesis probably was Australia. We had played Australia two times before that. And and every time we'd play Australia, we would miss summer. We would miss the summer here, and we would catch winter in Australia. And so for two years, all we had was winter <laughs> in both continents. And so when the third Australian tour came up, I, I, you know, I said, I think she agreed that, now let's, let's do a movie. Now, you know, we got to do a movie, and we got to do it now, you know. Because we were, you know, when you start hitting places three or four times in a row, it's time to do move on, you know. So we, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a, a treatment for one movie, and, uh, and, and then Lou Adler got on board because he thought we were serious. And I was talking to other, uh, we were talking to other movie makers, and Lou Adler saw that, you know, we wanted to make a movie. So Lou Adler went up and, and secured a deal with Paramount. And, and as a result, we ended up doing a movie called Up in Smoke, which, uh, which astounded the movie industry. <laughs> when you look back, all these movies, they've had such a huge role in people's lives. Uh, whole Generations of kids grow up. It's something that people would put on as like the something to watch at a party, something to watch as get-togethers. It's really, it was like a, almost a religious sort of cult phenomenon when I was a kid. I don't know what, what it's like with young kids today, but certainly when I was young, it was like that. And, and I wasn't even in the, in the 70s, really. I was in the 80s. Do you have a favorite uh, movie moment for each of you? Cheech, is there something that comes to mind? Is just something that, made you, that, that makes you laugh or was fun or challenging to do at the time? I liked doing the, the, the scene in the car and up in smoke, you know, even though we did that every night on stage for a long time, that we still found stuff, new stuff to do in the, in the, 
when we were in front of the cameras that we'd never done before, and it was just, you know that was going to translate to the audience, and that was, that was so much fun, because I think movies was our, our best genre, you know, you could see us and hear us and, uh, at the same time, and it was, we just, what we did is we identified this stoner culture that was worldwide, you know, and it hadn't, people hadn't really made that connection yet, you know, but it soon started sprouting up all over the place, and we have fans, and it's generational. You know, it's like an initiation to the stoner culture. <laughs> you know when your kids are smoking. Right, <laughs> right. When those movies are on, you know it's time to have a, have a talk with, with Junior. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, Tommy, any, any similar reflections? Yeah, well, you know, what, what we did, when you think about it, uh, we were the first reality movie. <laughs> like, instead of actors playing <laughs> roles, we were really actors being ourselves or being a portion of ourselves, you know? And, and uh, that's why Up in Smoke is still relevant today. I mean, I watched a clip of it the other day, and, and I, I laughed, you know, it was an honest laugh, because the, the bits are so, so iconic, you know? I mean, Cheech's lowrider uh, scene in the beginning of the movie, to me, that's my favorite, you know, where he goes out and, and washes his car and, and, and dances around and... <laughs> and then gives the car the finger to open the door. I mean, it, the whole thing was so iconic, and, and it changed everybody's perception of, of Chicanos and lowriders. You know, it, it, it humanized everybody. Instead of being, the, you know, the type of, people, uh, of Chicanos that Donald Trump talked about, you know, we became very human and very uh, approachable and very real and, and like everybody else. And, and, and more than anything, it was, there was no moral ending to, to Up in Smoke. Up in Smoke, uh, the ending is, well, these guys are just going to continue. <laughs> They're just going to, hey, man, let's, let's do this some more. And, and we wrote right down the, the road, you know, into the future. And uh, it, it, was just, it was just give everybody hope. It give everybody a smile on their face. And no one was sad, and that's why they watch it still today. Those are great points, and also the multiculturalism is such a huge point. Um, the uh, there, there's a lot of credit to be given to that, and and those are wise words that you said about doing that, and and how we all are really the same when you when you get by these these barriers that that people put up. One of the other fascinating things about talking with you right now is the way marijuana has changed so much over the years. It's now legal for recreational use at this time in four states and Washington D.C. There are countless medical marijuana states that that are going, um, and. I, when I think of you guys, it's almost that was another way you were pioneering, you know. And and now when you look and you see what is happening across the country with this and around the world too, between Canada, Mexico, a lot of countries with with changing legislation. Cheech, first, uh, did you ever imagine such a thing would would happen or transpire? And and where do you see it heading? You know, it just gets wider and wider and more accepted. We always said that we were middle of the road dopers. And that was the norm. You just don't realize it, you know. And so we were, we just saw, you know, as as a generation came up or got older and spread out culturally everywhere around the world that 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 uh, phenomenon, that culture, was just going to keep going, and it has, you know. So it's it's uh, we we like this and talk rather than beer. Uh, that's a good. That's a good point, and uh, and yeah, it does sort of. As those people get older, it does change. You get presidents now who say they've used used uh, that and and even other substances. Tommy, on that same note, your reflections on these incredible changes, and as a man who even had to serve time for mailing bongs, not even not even mailing an actual drug of any kind, but mailing I mean, really, which is a, it's hard for people to accept that something like that could even put someone behind bars. But w- what are some of your reflections? Well, you know, when, when you think about um, the, the, the reason they called it marijuana, you know, be, be, when it was legal, it was called hemp. And it was, uh, we had towns and countries named after hemp because hemp was such an important crop for the, uh, for the, for, for the world. You know, you know, Columbus would not have discovered America had it not been 
for his hemp sails, you know, his canvas sails, and the hemp rope that he used on his boat. So, um, so you know, the thing is, when they wanted to make it illegal, it was for money. You know, DuPont uh, wanted to sell his plastic uh, to the world, and he couldn't do it. They couldn't do it as long as hemp products were available. And so when they found that Mexicans coming across the border were carrying bags of this hemp uh, for their own use and to, to as currency, uh, you know, when they got here, you know, that's how they would uh, get their stake and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, make some money. When that happened, Hearst, you know, when he, when he, he, he had a, a some, uh, you know, arresting some uh, Chicano for, for a possession of hemp, but they called it what the Mexicans called it. It was the slang word for hemp, which was marijuana. Mm. And and then the marijuana made it illegal. It's a racist law, and it always has been. You know, for it, to this day, you know, more blacks and, and Latinos are in jail for marijuana than any anybody else in the world. And so it was just a, a racist law that had to die of its own volition. You know, because the knowledge, it's the cell phone that really got uh, everything going here. You know, because now when you say something... Before the words are out of your mouth, someone's on a cell phone checking to see whether or not you're telling the truth. And when they found that out about marijuana, when they found out how how much it helped people, how much you know for sleeping, for uh, the, the, the list is endless. You know what, what what it what it helps and what it cures. You know, like me, I had cancer and 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 I'm I'm walking around, I'm doing shows in Hawaii. And, and this is like uh, a month after my operation, and it's all thanks to marijuana, the pot. So it was a racist law. It is a racist law, and, and we're slowly crawling out of that hole. And, and by, by the time they make it legal around the world, we're going to see peace, and we're going to see prosperity everywhere. You have such a great outlook, and God bless you that you're healthy battling that and uh, that you've come through uh, like you have, sending you lots of aloha, a big hug on on that one. As we go to wrap it up with you, because I know your time is tight, and, and I'm hopeful that we'll get a chance to have a little follow-up with you when you're, when you're in Honolulu, maybe get a little better uh, sound quality out of that one. You, when you talk about coming to Hawaii, You've been to Hawaii before, both of you. And in fact, one of the things about your life that was neat is you did a lot of on the road. You did tours. You sometimes were on with cool musical acts. As I recall, a listener at the old station had sent me a um, like a poster, and, and it had been, I think, in Diamond Head Crater one time. Yeah. You were <laughs> you were on the bill. Um, and, and I guess we'll start with you, Cheech. Do you have specific memories of coming here in the past uh, that, that just uh, resonated? <laughs> I love Hawaii. I've had a lot of uh, good times there. Got a lot of friends there. I remember one time in, in the, at that Diamond Head concert, I was sleeping backstage on a cot, you know, napping in between that, and and I woke up, and there was right across from me was Billy Preston and his mama, and and uh, I'd always heard the rumor that his mother was a, a, a sapphire, a name of an aunt, a television show. And I, I woke up, and there she was, Sapphire from Angus and Andy, was really dressed in the mother. That was, that's why I remember of Hawaii. I mean, you know, kind of typical, I guess. Those are, yeah, you were on the bill with some. Any other names, Cheech, you can remember from the that? Lion, the Lion of Family Stone was there. Uh, do you know any of them? Cheech, the Power Power. Wow. Tommy, any names you can remember? Any interesting encounters? Well, I, I, when I'm in Hawaii, I can barely remember my own name. <laughs> all, all I remember of that concert was laying in the elephant grass, trying to trying to figure out how I'm going to get up to do a show. I was so stoned. I was so stoned. I couldn't even feel my 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 face. You know, I could... I could barely move, but we did it. I don't know how we did it, but we we pulled it off. Uh, it's a it's a great thing that uh, that you guys are back and doing this again and and touring the state. Uh, I hope that when when you come through town, maybe we can get some time to teach, hear about your mescal, hear about your Chicano art, some of the humanitarian ventures you're up to. If if there's time when you're in Honolulu, I'll try to work with your people and just get a few minutes before your Hawaii theater show. I'd really love to do that. You think that might be possible? Sure. 
if that's not if that's, sure. if that's not a huge hassle, it would be it would be gr- appreciated. Uh, and likewise with you, Tommy, the things that you're up to, we'd love to reconnect. I'd had Tommy as a guest several different times over the years, so it'd just be wonderful to, to see him again. Yeah, I think I think I tried to do sports one time with you with you guys. Do you remember? Um, I rem- <laughs> and and we we smoked up first, and oh man, I couldn't read. I couldn't read my own name. <laughs> some st- some of our stories, Tommy, as I was trying to avoid, were not are not things meant for the radio. But <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah. that's the territory that comes when you're dealing with Richard Cheechman and Tommy Chong. It's the legendary Cheech and Chong, and back in the islands. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Giving you guys a lot of aloha and uh, hoping that we can connect when you're in town. Thank you for taking time for us. <laughs> Take care. Uh, bye bye. Take care. All right. Thank you, Cheech. Bye bye now. Aloha.